Behold, adventurers, as we hearken back to an age before Thacko, a time known as old school role playing. A time long before the age of the Mythwits, the show dedicated to all things geek, pop culture, drenched in absurdity, and coated with sarcasm. Every week we bring on an industry guest to talk about the ever-expanding, ever, ever-expanding Geekiverse. We do our dandest to be funny, but there are no guarantees. I am your host, Peter Bryant, and joining me on this episode is my co-host, Mike Kafis. Hello. And on this episode, we're talking with Matt Finch. Hey, Matt. Hey, everybody. So Matt is the any award winning or any any winning any winning any award winning author of Swords and Wizardry Wizardry Clone of O O D and D. I didn't pre-read this. <coughs> blah, blah, blah. The Tome of Adventure Design, the Quick Primer for Old School Gaming, the Mouth of Doom levels of Rappin Athuk, and a number of other books. He has a very attractive Patreon attractive. Well, that's attractive. A very active Patreon community, and it runs also a, a very attractive community. It's very I say att- right now. My yes. patrons are better looking than anyone else's. <laughs> I'm sure they are. And he runs a YouTube channel called Matt Finch's uh, Matt Finch RPG Studio. Matt, uh, again, welcome to the Mythwits. We're going to be talking. You know, I want to talk a lot about old school gaming. I don't know if you're tired of, of of talking with people about it or not. I mean, you seem to really love it, so I'm hoping this isn't like rehashing a bunch of stuff. Um, a lot of our fans are role players. Um, it's not a it's not a role playing show, but we do a lot of episodes on role playing. We got a lot of fans who are role players, and some of them, like I don't know, Mike, might not fully understand what old school role playing is, right, Mike? Uh, I have different uh, thoughts of what it, what it could be. I'm, I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm not sure. Because I said to Mike, well, I mean, not that he doesn't know what it is, but I, I'd mentioned, I said, I said, well, we could talk to him about, you know, OSR. And he's just like, and that is, and I was like, old school role playing. He's like, right, old school role playing, right. <laughs> so anyway. <laughs> Well, and um, then I'm like working on the show, Doc. I'm going to throw myself out there. I'm working right? on the show, Doc. I'm like, all right, we'll talk about old school DMing. Is that like, uh. Like I'm an old school DMer, or is that more like just old school game DMing, or is there a difference? Because I mean, I've I've like been DM'd by some of the greats, and uh, there is a little bit of a different style. So I don't know if there was if it's a stylistic thing or not. So I'm I'm curious about getting into that. All right, well we can talk about it then. Okay, awesome. Okay, so um, well, all right. So the question is, <laughs> what the hell is it? <laughs> right, right, exactly. <laughs> that's a, that's a, I mean, that's, maybe a, that's a broad. Old. Maybe I'm just old, and maybe it's just for me. It, it is school DMing or well, school. Well, it, it may it may be. I mean, that is that is for 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 a lot of people. The uh, you know the the whole the whole terminology doesn't even make as much sense now in the fifth edition era. But back during you know third edition, uh, and with Pathfinder, when you had these very very complicated. Uh, you know, granular tactics for what people could do. And then, uh, you know, in second edition, there was the sort of story arc that, you know, uh, that people were, uh, you know, had to follow. And so, you know, just uh, the old school, um, you know, just a group of people got together in, uh, I don't know, around 2004 thereabouts and started, you know, communities talking about the fact that, you know, the game that they used to play was different and how was it, you know, how exactly was it different? And, um so the you know the, and, and people started you know like the internet does you know parsing things ad absurdum you know to the to the different levels of, of stuff like that um but uh you know uh, if you want a really 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 simple uh you know metric to start with it's when, it's at what point do skill checks begin to become more important than puzzle solving is probably that that's probably your your big break where that comes in there right yeah because i've heard a lot of people say you know um you know the old school role playing is more about talking about what you're going to do uh you know coming up with ways to do things instead of like flipping through a book and going all right well the rules here says that if you want to walk 10 feet every five minutes you roll 1d6 and then compare that to your you know what i mean it's it's uh it's more of like yeah, well, you, you mean, walk up the hill. You got to be honest, though. You got to be honest, though. That that happened on day one. The first time somebody ever opened a D and D book, 
that started happening. The whole thing right. about, you know, it says that on the, on the, you know, the, the thing, but yeah, I mean, I think there's, it's just that there's more in a lot of the later rule books that, um, you know, give the players, um, you know, the, give the players resources, um, which, um, at, which at the same time kind of reduces the DM's ability, um, to, to describe what all is going on. But, you know, it's a, I mean, the, the whole thing's a false dichotomy really of old school right. versus new school kind of concept. It's just that, you know, once again, it's the internet. And so, you know, you, you, you do get these things, but when you're talking about old school gaming, there's a whole lot of different things you might be talking about. You might be talking about it's rules light, but a D and D wasn't actually all that rules light. It might be talking about, you know, I like, you know, diagram maps as opposed to artistic maps. I like uh, black and white art as opposed to color art. Um, you know, I'm into exploration and puzzle solving, and those aren't as as well uh, handled in the later editions. Um, you know, and then on the other hand, you've got, uh, you know, people who are later on saying, you know, hey, you know, uh, I, I want to skip over the boring stuff. So just give me a number that I can roll and we'll move past the boring stuff. And a lot of it has to do with who, who considers what to be the boring stuff. Right. So. Right. And, and you know, it always it says in every book, you know, just about every book that I've read, uh, at least D&D &D wise, um, you know, it says that this is your game. You've bought this book. It belongs to you. Use or throw out any rule you, you want, change any rules you want. This is your, you, when you're the game master sitting at the table, uh, this is your world. So do, you know, do you any way you want to. So having more rules is not bad unless you get rules lawyers who will fight with you. But if you're just like, you know, like our group, the game master has final say. It's like, I, I'm the game master. This is what I say goes and this is what, how it's going to happen. Yeah. And in and in fifth edition, I mean, here's 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 one of the things that, again, we're sort of talking in the past because third edition isn't the uh, isn't the premier edition anymore. But it was a very elegant system in which everything was tied into everything else. If you took out if you tried to take out one thing, a lot of time you'd screw things up all through the whole system, whereas in first edition um, and in fifth edition, things tend to be a little bit more compartmentalized. So you can take out a, you know, a block and say, we're going to change it with this and it won't cause problems everywhere else. So. Right. Right. And we're, we're just going to skip over that one that's between three and five. Yeah. Because... Everyone does. And right. that's the best. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I pick on people, you know, I'm, I'm, Honestly, you play what you like. If you're happy, if, if you like fourth, it's fine. That's cool. More on, you know, go go for it. Uh, I just pick on it because I hated it. I played yeah. it. And I was like, I don't know what this is. I can't stand this. <laughs> and um, but but you know, what, there are some people who love it. Matt, what is your go-to edition then, or what is your go-to game? What do you what do you find yourself playing the most? Um, mainly original D and D, and um, you know, I I I took the. Uh, um, those books and sort of codified them together into what was basically a complete version of OD and D right before the split over to AD and D. And so that's uh, and the name of that game is Swords and Wizardry. But you know what am I actually playing? It's it's OD and D. So okay, so and we say OD and D. You mean like, that like the, the the edition the little those little books, books yeah. um, plus Dragon Magazine and all of that stuff prior to um, the the awesome uh, Trampier Demon Idol book that came out that's that's the point that's after what i play so okay yeah so <laughs> yeah i cut my teeth on first edition so i'm i'm uh, 49 right now and i started playing in 1980 um so uh, you know the first edition had, i guess what did it come out in 79 had it had it been out what uh, like a year was it 78 I think in 78, the Monster Manual came out, yeah, right. um, which was oddly the first thing that came out. You, so you had monsters for a game that hadn't actually come out yet, um, but they were you know, usable with OD&D. So it came out and then the Player's Handbook came out and then quite a bit, like at least a year later, the Dungeon Master's Guide finally came out. So. Right. Yeah. And that's that's what I cut my teeth on. So when I talk about any D&D that I've played, that's pretty much the biggest bulk of D&D the D &D version I've played on. Um, yeah. You know, and and it's funny too because you know it, it's it's like Monopoly in, in some ways. In that, and, and bear with me because I know that's like it's almost a travesty saying that, but <laughs> is that there's there are certain rules that people completely ignore, and then when you look back, you're like, yeah, you know what? We never even played with that rule. Like, but it was there. It was, it was right there. Yeah, um, you don't actually get five hundred dollars when you land on free parking. Right. 
Right. <laughs> and you don't. And and also in Monopoly, another another rule that everyone ignores is that if you land on a property and you don't buy it, then anyone else at the table can buy it and they basically can auction it off. It gets auctioned off by the bank. So right. if if I want it and Mike wants it, we bid against each other until somebody gets it, uh, which is a rule that I didn't even know existed until recently. And I was reading this thing and I'm like, holy shit, that totally changes the game. That That makes it that makes it a better game. Why didn't we use that? Uh, and there's things in D and D like that, in in AD and D like that. Um, you know, uh, I'm trying to remember what was like weapon profi- was weapon proficiencies in, in AD and D. No, what you're thinking about is weapon um, is the speed factors. Right. The speed the speed factors and the effectiveness of the weapon against different kinds of armor class, at which nobody used. Right. But in a way, that was kind of cool. You know, I mean, it would it you know it would kind of it was a balancing thing, right? Because if it could use a knife like three, four times versus a sword that gives a knife, you know, gives a dagger rather, uh, uh, that you're taking one of the advantages away from that, that it, that it would have given you. Yeah. But, you know, a, a lot of the stuff in, in AD&D wasn't, um, you know, it, it wasn't perfect design either. I mean, there were, there were a lot of little toggles and things that were, that were made in there. That was, a, that was a difficult rule. But again, you know, I think most people who played it, um, or at least a, a huge number of people who played it started out with the Holmes box set, um, which was the, uh, the the sort of, you know, that was their first basic set they ever came out with. And that one, um, I think a lot of people just kind of, they had that and then they got their player's handbook and they just said, okay, here's extra classes, but we're going to keep playing using these rules that we, you know, that we learned to play on them, the basic rules. So. Yeah. And so, so with the, um, with the with O D and D, now I know like the the basic set came out and like elves were a uh, elves were a, a race and a class. Did did O D and D have any of that kind of stuff? Yeah, that was uh, elves and uh, and dwarves and halflings were they were basically their own uh, classes, or at least you didn't have a lot of classes that you could um, could really choose from. I, I think that that uh, you know not not to get you know weird with a zillion different editions. I think that really came in with the Moldvay box set where they were specifically that way. But it was kind of interesting because the idea was, you know, elves, they're, they're different. They've all got this magic user thing going with the fighter thing, and that's just what makes you an elf, you know. Hmm. So. Okay. All right. So, um, so Mike, I'm, 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 I'm kind of talking a lot. So did you want to jump in there? Uh, I... I wrote some questions out. So which ones do you think would be intelligent for me to ask? Oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> All right. I mean, they sounded intelligent when I wrote them, but now I'm like, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> All right, fine, fine. All right, I'm so and here. everything falls apart and we end up talking about kittens <laughs> and stuff like that. So it's not the worst thing. All right. So <laughs> so Matt, what <laughs> I had uh, role playing. Right, right. Now, um, Mike, I'm sorry, you didn't ask this one though yet. Did you? Uh, what is what is about old games that keep you coming back? Yeah, yeah. Like, uh, suppose, like, see. All right. First of all, let me just say this. My my thing is like I, I'm a big uh, cyberpunk fan. Okay, and I like that genre. I, I seem to be more of the techno type of genre and traveling and things like that. Um, the D and D aspects have ne- has never appealed to me, but that's just me. And I I embrace and I love how everyone else does. Now I will say that, and I'll say once in a while, like when I'm at con, when I do some con gaming, I do it and I enjoy it. I love it. So for you, like, what is it about that that really keeps you coming back? Well, I mean, it's kind of a flip side because I, I actually um, pretty much stick with either classic traveler or D and D, and just those are the you know the mindsets that I like. Same way that you know someone prefers cyberpunk, same way that someone you know, might prefer superhero games. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not somebody who plays, I'm not somebody who loves figuring out a new rule set and playing in a new thing. I, you know, I, I tend to just go back to the different things, you know, that, that I like. And my image of, you know, science fiction is sort of, you know, firefly traveler kind of thing. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and, um, D and D is, um, it's just sort of where the mind sits, you know, I like, you know, being an elf wandering around, you know, bringing my magic user up to, cause I'm always a magic user, you know, playing, uh, you know, trying to get up to be an, an arc mage and all of that good stuff. So, um, you know, I, I it's not, uh, it's not anything about the rules in particular. I think it's just that that's kind of, you know, where, where that, that's the, you know, the, the, the good place for, for where my mental fantasy life is, is, you know, 
All right, so you bring up an interesting point there. So you, you have you have a character type that you you gravitate towards a lot. Is there a specific? Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. So what what was that again? It, it, uh, well, I, I call it a magic user. It'd be a wizard, you know, okay. nowadays. But uh, um, yeah, I you know I don't know what it says about me, but <laughs> <laughs> no, nothing, nothing. No. So I have I, you know I try. So when I was playing D and D back in the day, I tried playing. I think two different times tried playing a magic user, and we always kind of started. We'd usually start at first level, but sometimes we'd start at third or fourth just to like so that our characters, you know, weren't like just goblin fodder. Um, <laughs> what uh, I always had a hard time surviving any period of time with a magic user in oh, the yeah, early that's days. The thing about that's the thing about the uh, the early edition, you know, magic user was a glass cannon. You had one, you know, at first level you had you know one to four hit points. You had one spell that would win any battle, you know. Um, sleep right exactly you know yeah. you, you had your sleep spell then you get up to fifth level and you've got and then you've got fireball and right. you know it's <laughs> right so you know but that's the that's the key is that you know um the uh you know the, in, in the in the older editions your magic user is you know hoarded carefully in the middle of the party and kept alive by everybody else until things get really hairy and then they cut loose with the spell and everyone goes back to town uh, and the magic user rememorizes the spell and everyone heals up. It's, you know, just, you know, there are some patterns that you see every time. Right. right. I was always partial to Rangers. I liked Rangers a lot. They were my, they were fun to play. Cause it's just, Rangers they were... are a lot more, they're a lot more durable. Are you one, you're yeah. one of the guys that goes and pushes levers and pulls buttons and yeah. does all of that kind yeah. of, yeah, that's what, so a magic user is really not the right class for you to play. No. <laughs> it's like, there's a lever on the wall. Let's pull it. <laughs> Obviously, yeah. I think uh, in the later editions, when you get around to like barbarians and stuff, that you're starting and getting into my uh, my bailiwick right there. Yeah, there you uh, go. <laughs> I like to be the the meat puppet that people beat on. Um, no, but I do. I also I also enjoy playing thieves. I I did have some fun playing um, playing thieves there. Uh, but it's a different mindset altogether. You pull the lever, but you're very clever and crafty about pulling it. First, you check it for traps, and then you you know. You then you make a pulley. Then, then you lock your pulley down underneath the lever. You run a rope from the lever down right. through the pulley. You pull down the lever from a distance of about forty or fifty feet away. So right. And if a door swings open, you've got your peg that you put in the floor to hold the door open, so it doesn't swing shut on you when you go in the room. Your yeah, iron... so that's one of the things I do miss with the with with all of the newer editions is that the bizarre. Um, uh, you know, Goldberg device kind of gadgetry that went on, you know, when in, when we were all in middle school and, you know, you just figure out some kind of wily coyote way to, you know, to, to rig things. And that's not, you know, that doesn't so much show up anymore. Right. And when you did those, but the before, was that done? Like, did you do that like orally in a game? Like just, there's a, the, you see a lever and this and that and the other, and like you had to just people talk through that or did you ever, did you guys ever just present like, look, Here's a puzzle. You find this, solve it. <laughs> no, it, I mean it, you didn't. You didn't have stuff for it. You just have people be like, you know, I've got a, I've got a pulley in my, you know, equipment list that I had the blacksmith make for me. So, uh, you know, standard operating procedure. We're gonna put it down. You know, we're gonna lock it in some way or other, and you know, and do our thing. You had people bringing. Uh, uh, door. I, I, one story was people who would bring a door into the dungeon with them. Why? Door. Because you've got a hold portal spell that will lock a door completely if you have a door. And so they would just put their their door up somewhere, you know, if there was a, an archway or something, and then cast their spell on it. Instant blockade. You, little little <laughs> tricks like that. God, I never thought of that. That's awesome. That's awesome. The meanest trick I ever pulled was uh, I had a character that had a um, he had a portable hole, and. Um, and I used it, you know, for a while, and then something happened where the party screwed him over. And he, I was playing, and I was playing a thief at that time. And he was, he was in, was he evil? I think he was evil, but he wasn't like, I think he was like, was he neutral evil? Anyway, whatever doesn't matter. Anyway, so he got pissed off, and I was like, you know what, the party's party screwed me over. I don't care about playing with them anymore. So I got with the with the game master, and I I uh, booby I got ahead of the players, and I actually set my own booby trap in a dungeon. I set it so there was a pit that they would fall into. And because the guy I knew was leading it, he had this tactic, and this is what you know. This is like if you know the party, this is things you can use against them. And he had a staff of teleportation that he always carried with him. And if the party ever got in trouble, he would teleport everybody out. So they fell in this trap, 
him and one other guy falls in a trap and they go into a portable hole. But the game master says, yeah, you fall into this pit and it's all dark. You can't see anything. And he goes, I'm going to tele back, teleport back to where we were, which is what I was expecting. And boom, blew up everybody. And it was, it was, a <laughs> um, uh, that was, that was my favorite crafty thing that I ever did. I, I never did anything quite so crafty since then, but that the was the meanest, the meanest one I ever heard of was a DM who, uh, somebody in the party had a, a, a ring of wishes and he somehow managed to get them all joining together in a rousing chorus of, I wish I were an Oscar Mayer wiener. Oh God. <laughs> Oh, here's all right. So I was in a D&D club and I overheard this one. This was not one of mine. This is another game master did this to one of his annoying players. The guy kept looking over the DM screen and and, and he told him, he's like, look, man, if you keep doing this, I'm going to punish you. You can't can't be looking over the screen. And he happened to see that there was a, a ring of feather falling. Uh, on, on the guy's page as one of the treasures. So when they killed the monster, he goes, well, I grabbed the ring. And he knew that the game master knew at that point that he's like, all right, he saw this. He really wanted that. So they, they come to this, this, um, this like waterfall and it was, you know, like a hundred foot drop or, or whatever. And the ring was in the module so that if somebody had the ring and they figured out what it was. They could get down to the bottom. And I think they had to release some lever or something to open up some stairs. And he's like, all right, uh, I'm just going to jump off. Right. And, uh, the game master was like, all right, yeah, you jump off. And it was he, he turned it into a ring of water walking. So when the guy hit the water, he splattered like he'd hit concrete. And <laughs> I was like, damn, that's messed up. But that was fair. I mean, that's what you get for looking over the GM screen. Yeah, that, that, that sort of goes outside all bounds on that one. <laughs> I got a question. Do you feel like back in old school days and old school um, DMing and uh, gaming that more there were more player deaths per adventures and and campaigns than there are today you know like you know players today <laughs> well i think I, I think so i think so but i think that there, there's a, a reason why that tends to change um with the rules because um it takes more time to make a character in the later rule sets just because there's more stuff to fill out you know on a character sheet so i i think there's a little bit more um I, and just that sort of changes the game with you know with you, you know y'all remember with the um you know additions in the 80s it took about five minutes or less to come up with a new character so it really wasn't a big deal um and uh you know and i think also there's uh you know there's there's become more focus on role playing the characters so people you know get more attached to it so you know i don't think people take the idea of characters dying out of the game but i think that they're um a little bit more careful about um you know not just having somebody fall into a pit of lava and die you know which was <laughs> you know kind of the thing yeah i had a, this friend dave <laughs> ferber hey wait, hold on mike real quick this, this guy Dave Ferber, I'm on, on, on topic. The, the guy Dave Ferber, he uh, he used to play the same character every time. He'd play a, a half work fighter magic user. It's what he loved to play, and uh, um, he <laughs> he lost his character. And he's like, it was like right in the middle of the evening, so we still had plenty of time left to play. And this is when we were kids. You know, we'd play like five, six, ten hours at a go. And he's like, he's like, hold on, I can have a character in ten minutes, five if you let me keep the stats. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> <laughs> all right mike i'm sorry good no i i just wanted to see if we could switch gears and just talk a little bit more about adventure designing yeah sure okay uh, yep because i know uh, matt you said you, you do that um uh, i don't know first i don't know what a, a good primer is talking about just uh a what what type of things i mean pete read off a little bit but what have you what type of stuff do you do now and what have you done in the past and then we'll get into more about you know like some um i guess uh design tactics and things. sure um well i mean i've written the probably the best known stuff is the the mouth of doom levels in rap and athic um you know that's a, a, a god it's hundreds of pages long the 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 whole thing overall um but i wrote the area that is where the first level characters you know can start um and uh so there's there, there are those and then i've written um Oh, a bunch of adventures. I mean, uh, Pod Caverns of the Sinister Shroom is probably one that's relatively unknown because it was for first edition. Um, uh, I've written a bunch of you know small adventures that are in the Frog God books, the Borderland Provinces. Um, so you know, various various adventures, Demon Spore, so on. Um, but 
I'm, I'm wandering off the question because you asked what I had written and I started answering that, but there was a second part to the question. Uh, just like um, what, uh, what I actually, what I kind of wanted to get into is like, again, uh, I'm trying to kind of wrap my head around what old school, you know, um, adventure designing and, and things like that in within that genre. Like, um, what do you think is important um, in designing like old school adventures, uh, like uh, things like having to do with structures and outcomes? Um, is there anything? Well, actually, yeah, I'll start with those two things. Yeah, well, I mean, I don't I'm not really sure that um, that there's a huge distinction in adventure design between old school and um, fifth edition D and D or any other game um, really that's out there, as long as you're playing to the, the strengths of whatever the system is. I mean, so with the old school stuff, you're going to be doing more, uh, you know, exploration. So you might have a really large dungeon. That's something that you'd never have time to complete if you were doing it with So, I mean, there's, there's things like that, but I mean, the uh, um, designing an adventure, I mean, I think the most important rule in there which i discovered is what people refer to as player agency but i've been saying for a long long time that the the point you know one of the, the main thing for designing a good adventure is giving the the uh the players meaningful choices for their characters that you know there there is a decision and it is something that will have a consequence along the line and they have to have enough information ahead of time to make that an intelligent decision you know unless they went in some direction where they didn't, but could have gotten that information, you know, that, that tells them how to do a, a thing. So, I mean, um, that, that's probably the, the main thing. I wrote a book called Tome of Adventure Design, um, which is, uh, you know, again, it's one of the Frog God publications, but what that is, is it's a book of, um, of tables for designing adventures, only they are different from, you know, most books of tables are something that you're going to be using, um, you know, at the at the gaming table. So you want to have a, a fairly small table with results that are all going to work out well. And mm -hmm. so there's a there's a uh, a difference there um, with the Tome of Adventure Design, which is that a lot of the tables um, you can sort of go into nested sub tables fairly deeply, um, and you can get a lot of of um, you know answers where you need to use some creativity to get the um, to get a, a good result but the point being that that's where you insert the creativity in there that you're trying to get you know for designing your adventure so it's, it's kind of a different book than the idea of something that's a quick reference table right okay. yeah so one of the things that i i noticed between like older modules and I'm not, even, I'm not even talking old school versus new school i'm just talking about when you take models modules that were written back in you know the late 70s and and you know into the 80s uh and then as you get get into later modules uh, or adventure sets um i find that the creators started putting in more stuff to allow you to ask questions and do investigations and so that if you spent time uh infiltrating the module uh you know and engaging engaging with npcs and going to the library and doing research that kind of stuff that you had a better time as the adventure went on and you got rewarded for for spending more time doing things um, to to educate your character about what's going on yeah I think that's right I mean a lot of the a lot of the early ones um, the really early ones were actually just um, they, they would take a tournament module that they sure. had done and then they would flesh that out a little bit so I, I mean there you definitely had um, you know the the a lot of the really famous ones the you know the uh, the Giants modules and uh, so on were um, they were relatively tactical. They were very bounded in space because if you're running a tournament module, you can't have people, you know, <laughs> going off the map and 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 things right. like that. Um, and they're not usually going to do any sort of you know long discussions with people. Um, and so yeah, I I think that when things came around to the idea of we are doing things for people to be playing at their home tables it needs a little bit different spin on things than the, uh, than, than what was done in the original tournament modules. So, yeah. So, so to, um, to, to add on to that just real quick. Um, so have you seen the stuff by Goodman games that the, the, into the borderland, the Isle of dread expedition to the barrier peaks that they're, that they're doing. I know um, I saw into the borderland. I want to say Gary Con last year, maybe. 
Yeah, I've seen which one was it? Um, it may have but, been in, but it was like this thick. It's like Isle of Dread. Well, yeah, but it's the they took the the original one, they reprinted the original one, and then they put in the, you know, the, the more stuff, and I didn't read it in depth enough to figure out whether whether it was worth those additional words. Right. I mean, that's that's one of the things that you you get in in all kinds of writing, novels, whatever is that you know somebody who has no editor will write way more words than they ought to <laughs> right, right and uh you know and it, and there's you know there's a there's a real editing process when you're writing adventures for publication because um you really need to strip things down to the basic elements um with the with the mindset of there's someone who's going to be using this at a table they're going to have it open They've probably haven't, you know, they, they have not done what you, the author, assume they're going to do, which is to read absolutely every word carefully and lovingly, you know, re appreciating your prose and may taking notes and stuff like that. No, you know, they right. page they page through it, you know, you know, 20 minutes beforehand. And, uh, and you got to be cognizant of the fact that you've got somebody who is, you know, is not um, super prepared for it. Um, and so every page that they're on needs to be as usable as possible. And so, you know, even if it's stuff like, you know, put if, if room number one is next to another room on the map, make that next room room number two. Mm -hmm. So so that they're next to each other in the thing and keep the description small enough so that if you can, you've got room number one on page one and room number two on page two. And you can sort of look back and forth and realize there's something in room number two that is going to hear what they do in room number one. Just, you know, little things like that are um, an enormous part of the editing process on something that you're publishing, which you don't need to worry about when you're writing an adventure for your, you know, for your group when they're coming by four hours from now because you're going to remember right. it right and you want to make sure that if there's some magic item in the room that the bad guys could get a hold of like that's one thing used to drive me nuts is like there's a magic sword hanging on the wall and you defeat all the you know you defeat the bad guy in there and then you go over and you grab the magic sword it's like oh this thing kicks ass right and you're just right. like um why wasn't he using this kick-ass sword i mean if i'm the bad guy i'm you know I'm not just going to go, oh, that's a treasure for the adventurers, should they defeat us. You right, exactly. I mean? that's, that's loot. That's a loot drop. <laughs> right. A loot crate. Yeah. Loot crate. That's funny. Sorry. All right. Um, so, uh, Mike, you want to go into the next section, or did you want to talk about any more? Uh, do you want to talk about convention G DMing? Uh should we can i mean like what did uh matt what do you want to tell what would you rather talk about uh talking a little bit more about just writing D, &D resources or well uh, how often do you do convention dming for instance? well see what's happening here is that you guys ha are, are super organized and when somebody's coming onto the show you send them a form we should now, have on the we form you say what are the things you would like to talk about and so <laughs> i got on there and i typed in well there's this and there's this and there's this and there's this and so you guys, that's what you guys are working from. So let, let's, let's turn it, you know, turn it, turn it around and ask a question. You guys, you know, what, what do you want to ask about anything in gaming, any question, anything, what's, what are y'all's most, what are y'all most interested about gaming cyberpunk? Well, all right. Mike is so, cyberpunk. Well, well, I do, but we, we can, we can jump straight to then what we think is, um, happening in the RPG industry. I'm okay. just curious. Here, here's where I'll go with this, okay? All right. Uh, something unexpected happened as far as I'm concerned, and that is somewhere in Hollywood, role-playing got really cool and mainstream, and it's done wonders for the industry, but it's not going to last forever. And I keep thinking, like, well, what's next? What's going to happen as a result of or will it just be dropped like a hot potato? Uh, will it, you know, it will it have any repercussions from that? Will someday it become like passe? Yeah, what, do you, what do you think? Are we in an RPG bubble? Like, is it about, Is you know, do you think it'll pop? Yeah, I do, actually. I, 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 and, I, and I think that, you know, Mike's right on point with that. You know, there, there, are, there are fads. And, you know, right at the moment, you got, uh, you know, the, I guess your, your prime... Uh, probably the people who buy shit from commercials, uh, you know, age range of people or people who play D&D &D, and they're like, oh, hey, we're getting a real good response from doing 
you know, D and D. What what comes next? I it, it'll be whatever, uh, you know, the next generation of Americans did back when they were geeks and kids, which you know maybe anime. Um, you know, I don't know what all it'll be, but I, I my guess is that uh, you know role playing games are not going to be cool until the kids that are learning how to play it now come right back around, you know, to their point, and then it'll be cool again. You know, mm -hmm. Hollywood yeah. makes things cool for people who want to think that they're cool. Yeah, yeah. And yep. that's the thing. It's like I think it first started with like even people like Vin Diesel, who even before Vin Diesel was cool in Vin Diesel. It seemed like, well, that's kind of cool that he, when he was growing up, played RPGs and things. And uh, but somehow it morphed into certain people that glommed on to things. And then I think they glommed on to it and realized they liked it and, and they're sticking with it. But I'm just, you know, like I wonder how long I wonder also, like, there's a lot of people making, I mean, decent money. It's not like this is I, this is never going to be so mainstream that. I don't even know. I'm saying this and I could, you know, someone be totally wrong. Up, yeah. And, and say, here's where Mike was wrong. Right. You know, <laughs> it's never it's never we're never going to see on like, you know, NBC, CBS or any of the major things like some some role playing, you know, a, like really big role playing events and things like that. You know, yeah, there's uh, not going to be an SPN for role playing and ESPN right. for, for role playing. I, right. I, I think he would have done fine if he hadn't rolled that natural one. But I think right. that's going to take him out there. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> All the ogres definitely. He should have. He should have made a stealth check. What do you think, Bob? Yeah, yeah. It's a stealth check would have been handy right there. Up oh, here comes the ogre with the axe. I don't know about a stealth check. He's not strong on stealth. What they should have done was not have him in the second rank. He would have then. Then you could have used your stealth check with much, much more efficacy. And I think they would have taken down those orcs. But maybe that's just me. I don't know. <laughs> You're laughing, but I think that there's a place for that. And if the three of us had any balls, we would do it. Okay. <laughs> That said, uh, but, well, but you know what? We've got our equivalent of that, which I'll tell you what surprises me about the the recent popularity stuff um, is the people who are broadcasting um, the actual play games. And, which, you know, there's definitely there's a great big division there between the people who do post who do that in a studio and do post processing and come out with a really slick, um, mm -hmm. you know, thing or, uh, you know, people who are just out there playing the game and other people can watch it on a stream or whatever it is but that one really surprises me and that you really are they, they've got audience levels that tell you you know hey if there were if there were a format where people could do running commentary on a D, &D game I, I, you'd probably have that going on i mean it wouldn't it wouldn't be multi uh multi-million dollar advertising but mm -hmm. you know if 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 D, D were subject to something like that i think we'd see it right now people would figure out a way to do it yeah, I just I I, I gotta I think I think some of the problem is is that D and D isn't a fast paced thing. You can't you can't wrap a really interesting game up in an hour or or even maybe sometimes you could do it in two. But like one hour, you're just getting into the meat of things. You know, it's like like when you're watching a TV show. You know, you got all this attention that people have to spend on things. I mean, and I guess you could edit out all the stuff that's kind of boring ish. You know, like looking up things or or you know well here's they... what you could do here's what you could do when you when you create your espn for dnd all right you you, you got to do post-production but what you do is you take out the table talk and instead you put in the commentators okay and then so then you you play a little bit and then you've got the commentator saying well i'm not sure exactly what's going to happen next but i think they're making some terrible decisions here <laughs> right they're going over the plan now and and bob bob is just not you know he's he's not with the program he keeps checking his phone it's it's going to be right. detrimental to the party i'm telling you right now <laughs> let's see what happens all right tim i uh i look inside the tent i'll see now if you had done a listen check beforehand instead of you know farting around that mimic wouldn't have eaten you no no what mimic the tent the, the tent wasn't a tent see i and i gave you clues but you weren't paying attention oh peter's, wiz peter's wizard is going for that lever again this right? is going to be bad just like it was last character <laughs> exactly. here's exactly your right. legendary games death of the week right <laughs> You know, and I, I just, I honestly tell you, I cannot get my head around people watching other people play. I can't do it. I personally, I, even the, the, the top players, the, these like people in Critical Role, I hear all great, you know, great things about it. And I'm sure people really love it. I just can't. I'm like, I'm like two minutes in and I'm like, nope, that's, I'm bored. 
I'm, I'd rather be playing. If I'm going to watch a game, I'm going to be in that game. Yeah, you know? no, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't get it either. But it, I mean, it's, it's really clear that for a lot of people, um, you know, it's fun and relaxing, and sure. uh, you know, it's, it's something they. I, I got a feeling it's. I think it's different from playing a game. I, I, I think, I think what you've got is you got people who are in their mode of. I want to listen to something, you know, do I want to listen to, you know, NPR talking about, you know, garbage washing up on the shores of New Jersey or do I want to listen to people playing a game? I think I'll listen to people playing a game. You know, it's it's more that kind of thing, you know, or do do I you know, do I want to put on the, the ACDC soundtrack or do I want to listen to people playing a game? I listened to ACDC yesterday. I'll, you know, I'll listen to a game. I think it's more that kind of thing, really. All right, but yes. I, I don't get it either, so I don't know. As we're losing more of the first gen uh, create, creators um you know people like uh i mean i'm not saying that they're all gone but i'm saying like people as people like you know tim cask and you know obviously gygax and some of the the real um, tim is still alive no no we know we <laughs> reports know. of his demise have been greatly exaggerated no 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 mike knows <laughs> dead not that they're all dead but people like <laughs> as you know as our as our aging population yeah. ages out of the 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 table as he finally loses his character, eventually, maybe, because Jesus, I mean, he's fighting hard. Um, but <laughs> Jesus, um, Mike, God damn no, it. <laughs> oh my God. Like he's beating cancer. You know what I mean? Like he rolled a natural 20 on cancer. He did. You know? He totally did. Kicked the shit out of it. Yeah. Are you putting words in my mouth? I'm not doing anything. All I'm right. Not doing anything. But I, we get what you're saying. So as, as the older gamers age out, as they go. Who is going to take their place? You know, is it going to be some of the more? Is it going to be popularity, or is it going to be some some other some of the newer designers that that can uh, take their place, or will there be someone else? Will there be a new like, you know, <laughs> like some commentators or just you know the Twitch people? You know, um, it could it could. Uh, and, and I don't know. We all can have a have a guess about it, but whoever it is, it's going to shape the industry as as well. Sure. So. Well, I mean, I think there are a couple of people who are, you know, the the designers, um, you know, so Mike Merles, for example, um, you know, wrote Fifth Edition D and D. Um, clearly has, you know, um, under, understands games in a way that will let him be. Um, relevant going on into the future. I mean, it won't just be, you know, oh, what was, what did you do when you designed fifth edition D and mean, he's he's going to have stuff to to comment on going into the future. I guess is Monty Cook, um, you know, is is sort of in that same kind of thing. I think it's you know, it's people who what they did is something that carries forward, so that they still have something to say even after things have changed from whatever environment it was that made them famous in. So. Um, you know, I think the critical role folks, presumably, uh, if there is a new, you know, edition of D&D or if they, you know, switching to other games and so on and so forth, um, presumably they are not landlocked in 5th edition D&D. And assuming that, that they are not, um, their popularity is going to mean that they're going to continue to be stars in the whole thing. You know, right. people look for you know, for different things out of people. I mean, Tim, uh, you know, going going back to Tim, I mean, he's almost the, he's the s spokesperson for the dungeon in which your characters can die. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and, and uh, well, I, he, okay, yeah, he killed me, but I, I had, he used a 22nd level lich and I was second level, so I've still got a minor problem with that, but. <laughs> <laughs> killed, killed by, by Tim Cass, I've been yeah, killed by you. Tim Cass. There, there you go. See? Yeah, uh, there should be a T-shirt. Yeah, but anyway, so you know that's and that's a that's a, a, a whole style of play. You know, it's the more it's the more beer and pretzels approach to D and D, um, and uh, you know, and, and uh, it's the puzzle oriented thing. And and Tim, you know, continues to have plenty to say about that sort of thing, even when it's not D and D, um, and and so you know he is, uh, you know, so that's sort of the uh, the pattern, I think, of, of people who step up into being, you know, popular or listened to or whatever the vector is on something like that is, yeah. um, you know, the, 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 what they have to say as continuing relevance to gaming rather than just sort of, you know, I did a thing. I still do that thing. I have nothing to say outside of that thing. Um, uh, you know, that's that's how I think that works. How I assume right. it works. 
So using uh, Twitch and some of the, the, the newer um, types of role playing um, and, and venues for role playing, let's kind of switch gears and talk more about technology. Well, hey, Mike, uh, let's not keep him too long. He's got a dog to walk. Okay. Okay. That's fine. <laughs> All right. We're hitting, are we hitting, we're hitting the point where, uh, where well, we you, said we were going to cut off, huh? Yeah, right. Yeah, you're getting there. No, let's I, say how much more time you have. Okay. Um, well, I can go. I can go a couple more minutes. So what I was the, the thing thing is they were saying, well, why don't you want to play the uh, the game at the end? And I was because like because when I look at the timing, I know that my 150 pound dog <laughs> is going to be saying it is it is dark outside. It's time for us to go and take our walk now. So that's right. uh, uh, that, that's why I didn't. But yeah, no. If we got a couple more, you know, if you want to talk about technology whatever okay okay so well um what do you anticipate anything that's uh on the horizon that will change role playing or at least uh kind of be an adjunct or some sort of a um enhancement for it in the future yeah i think very much so the i mean i think virtual tabletops have already mm -hmm. let people who are in totally different places play in the same game you know and it i used to think oh that's kind of weird why would you do that but it's because people meet each other we, we already meet people across the country mm -hmm. i mean i would never have run into either of you guys if it weren't for the internet sure. you got yeah. people who played call of duty on an xbox with somebody else it seems completely normal you know to play games and communicate now with people that you've never even met face to face and so virtual tabletops are just they're, they're not even a strange thing. It's just here's a way of getting together and playing that game. And I think that, you know, you've are, you're already seeing um, a couple of people who are trying to get those into a first-person shooter kind of perspective where you take a, a map and you're actually able to see things through the eyes of your characters from the inside, like it's in Skyrim or something like that. If somebody's doing a Kickstarter on that, um, you know, not to sound mean about it, but I don't think they're going to be able to produce what they're talking about. But, for example, Fantasy Grounds, I know, is working on something where you can import an STL file. Uh, an STL file is just a, a it's the s standard package for describing a 3D object. And then you can right. put it into a 3D printer or you can put it into an animation program. It's just that's the basic thing with no additional data. They're working on a way that you can put those into a virtual space and have people move around. In, and then you'd be able to move your camera up and look down to see the tactical thing. I think that's going to be a really big um, change in the way that people um, – play the games. I'm not sure it's going to be a good one. I think that visualizing things in your head is a lot more powerful. Yeah. But I do think it's going to be a really big change that happens. I think yeah. honestly I think what really what what is is going to be something that sticks and is going to be a good a, a really positive technology is, you know, roll up screens. So where you can you can roll out a screen on a table instead of a battle mat, right? So it's basically yeah. an electronic battle mat. Once that's able to be done, and we're not, that's actually, you know, a relatively um, realistic uh, invention. They've already got the phones that can fold in half. So they've got m malleable screens. Um, five, you ten know, years, right? What's that? Five, ten years. Five, that's ten years. Awesome. No, no. No, I, I'm serious. I, I think this, I, I'm, I'm so just they can saying. They do that now. Yeah. They can, you can do a rollout interactive screen. It's just, it's incredibly expensive. Expensive, right. No, I'm sorry. That's what I'm saying. So with the technologies there, there's got to get the cost down. So once, once that happens, and, and we've seen it with our flat screen TVs cost, they're nothing now. You want to go out and buy a 60 inch, you know, TV. That was unheard of when we were younger. You know, I mean, just like that was sci-fi. That was jetpack territory. Um, but nowadays, you know, you can go out and you can carry the damn thing home by yourself. So um, I think that the rollout screen, because people are going to want to be able to put, you know, take them on vacations, put them on their walls, hang. You know, it's just it's it's going to be a thing. Or either that or AR is going to get sophisticated enough, and I think the screen will come first, but AR, uh, augmented reality, will get sophisticated enough that you could wear like a regular pair of glasses like this, and you'd see whatever you want to see. So you could have battle maps um, laid out on any surface, any flat surface, and they'll be able to put figures down or whatever, or, or see images of whatever you want to see. I think, honestly, I really think that's a direction that we'll see some really... Um, useful gaming stuff that'll stick around, but that's just my opinion. I, that's what I think. I I see that happening too, but with like VR and even in and like you were saying AR, 
um, that the only problem is the DM is going to have to become so much more sophisticated. Like, you know, I know there's going to be, there'll be packages with AR where it'll be, you know, like, oh, you can, you know, but you'll, he'll still have to have, you know, things that he had to set up ahead of time with all oh, this is where the, you know, hit this button when the, when the, uh, you know, the boss shows up and I'll do this when that happens. And, um, you know, for, for things to show up on, you know, on this field, but the God, it's, Dude, it's crazy. I, it's I, it's, it's going to be like a phone to, app. That was is it is it going to replace a, a a good DM who can just say you know all right so you guys are on this field field is you know like who who is just really good at describing things and and drawing a picture some DMs aren't really that good at that yeah but I mean hey we play like what? dude we we play like that we don't use any maps we don't use any anything we sit at the table we have our character sheet and we play and we have dice. Yeah. That's how when, we. When that's that's when, why I, that's why I think it's maybe not going to be such a great thing having these virtual tabletops that can do that. You know, what you know, the only thing that really improve will improve, you know, a, a a regular old gaming session is access to the information that you need. So maybe being able to store a picture. Um, of something that you want to put up and show people a, a, a way of showing them that picture, um, you know, a, a dice roller for, you know, um, when, um, when, when Peter's character pulls the lever halfway through the game and then that's the end of his character right. being able to, you know, uh, generate something, you know, uh, quick out of that. But um, I, I totally ag agree with you, Mike. I, th I think that, you know, when you've got, when you've only got, you know, a certain number of miniature figures to represent the characters or to represent the monsters, uh, you're going to go with picking the figures that you have for the monsters instead of dreaming up, oh, what if it was a 40 foot long slug that, you know, that has its brain visible in the middle and it has a laser harness on it that can shoot people with. I don't have a mini for that, but Freaking it might be your beams, man. Yeah. Everything's improved with laser beams. Right. That's right. Right now, I, and, and you know, another thing that might might be handy is just a more stable way of bringing people who are from other states to the game table or other places to the game table. People can't make it like they got, you know, maybe they got a family and they can play later at night, but they can't leave because, you know, they got to be home in case something happens or whatever. So, for example, you know, I the way we're doing this hangout, this is great. You know, if um, it would be really wild if there was a better way that, that we've done it before. Like we've played over Skype where we've had one person couldn't make it to the game, but they're like, but I can join in. I just can't drive down there. Um, so then you'd play by Skype, but it's, it's clunky and it's, it's not, it's not as immersive as it could be without like a lot of setup and work. But like, I think something, making something like that easier would be a good technology because then that might still, be where yeah. your, that might be where your VR comes in handy. Right. Is if the if the person who's joining in a game is actually able to see as if they're at the table with everybody. Oh, that would be cool. Then you might start that that would be something that would have a big effect. That Here's what cool. sucks about remote gaming. And Pete, I know it's been a while since I've been been at the at the table because I, I, I've taken a hiatus from, from gaming with the guys, but even the last time I was there, it it's it's so pronounced. See? Like, especially with you and I. See, when we're there and we're sitting right next to each other and everything else is going on and we just start clowning, just the two of us, we're just <laughs> talking and all that kind of stuff. You know what I mean? And then and then we get a little Ron and we get a warning or whatever. But it's like you can't have that, you know what I mean, without just disturbing the shit out of everyone else. Yeah. Yeah. I then, I like dude, I'm a I'm a, I'm an at the table guy. I prefer to role play at the table. I I want to be. It's, it's all for me. It's it's the whole thing. It's the hanging out with your friends. It's the yeah. it's the eating the chips and drinking the beer, or whatever it is that you're into while you're playing and rolling the dice. Um, you know, it's it's watching somebody's expression when they roll something horrible or something great. You know, it's like that whole thing, or somebody throwing their dice across the room or lighting it on fire because it was rolling terrible. Um, those kind of things, I, I think, you miss by not being there. But that's that's just my take. All right. All right. So let me let me take the the the, the gap there to say that the, the I am starting to have problems with the dog deciding yep. it's time okay. for me to take him. So right. I'm going to go ahead and sign off, guys. It's been really really great being on the show. I appreciate you inviting me. All right, Matt. All right. Awesome. Thanks for joining us. Definitely. And Matt, just so you know, even after you go, we as we close the show up, we're gonna we'll plug your Patreon. 
We'll uh, plug your Facebook. <laughs> That's yeah. great that y'all do the advertising for me. We do. Absolutely. Absolutely. Matter of fact, we'll do it right now. Everybody go to patreon.com forward slash Uncle Matt. That's two T's. Uh, go to his Facebook page, Matt dash Finch dash RPG dash studio and a whole bunch of things. But if you just type in Matt Finch on Facebook or you just click the link that's right there in the description, you go right to his Facebook page. All right. Take it, care of you guys. Thank you very much for, right. uh, for having me. Awesome. Thanks, Thanks Matt. Bye Thanks bye. for joining us. All right, Mike, we're going to play a game. We got time. Uh, do we have time? Oh, no, it's like nine fifty-five. What do you? Yeah, let's, your call. Uh, is it a quick game? Can you make it quick? I'll tell uh, you what. I'll tell you what. This is going to be. This is going to be uh, a a taste of what the game will be that we could play either next week or some other time. How's okay. that? Right, sounds good. Do? Sounds good. Sam, how about that? All right, a little wet your whistle. Uh, whistle. Well, yeah, this is called. Uh, that word in Z. Okay. That word in Z. That word in Z, as in Generation Z. Okay. As in, when you and I used to play that game on the show opener, and we used to be like, hey, oh. what does this word mean? You know? Okay. Except, you know, we, we, we kind of went, you know, we were circling the drain. I, I, I put us in the upper tank on these. Okay. All right. Uh, all right. The, these are upper deckers, not lower deckers? Yeah. 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 Okay. But uh, for instance, okay. <clears throat> As an example, and I'm not going to use uh, one of them in here because you know that one. All right. So, um, uh, Peter, what does T mean? If I were to say uh, me, me and my friend, we we had some we had a bathtub full of tea. What would that mean? You and your friend together had, had a, bath a bathtub full of tea. Full of tea. So you two were taking a bath together. Uh in tea, yes, but it was a more of a uh of what is that called? Not a uh, literal tea, but a a metaphorical tea. Metaphorical tea. A dream. No, a tea is a tea is a dream. Tea is a dream. No, that would be wrong. Okay. Peter. That would tea. be Hold on. That would be Yes. Tea is the real dirt. Gossip. You know? You had a bath in gossip. We had a bathtub full of tea. In other words, I, that was the that was a uh, that was actually something that was that two I at heard. once. Huh? That's two at once. A bathtub full. Like I've never heard that expression before. And then well, tea. Because you're obsessing on the bathtub when that was just in a sentence. Okay. Tea. Tea what? is the word, and there was so much tea it was a bathtub full. I've never heard tea. a mother. I've never heard anyone say that a lot of something is a bathtub full of it. That's so okay. well because you're thinking of it. People referring to it as tea. Listen, I no, heard no, no, this. No, 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 no. Anything. No. Oh God. Never mind. Never mind. You're not getting it. it Why would you fighting. say bathtub? What What does bathtub have to do with anything? It's a bad example. Is what I'm saying. That is a horrible example. It, well, I used it because it was a, a truckload real of. What if I had a truckload of tea? A truckload is something that is a lot of something. A bathtub of something is is not a saying. Really? Because like tea. Tea is in, you know, Lipton drinking tea. Why wouldn't you fill a bathtub with water and put a lot of tea, a dink dunk a lot of tea in it? Why would you, you do that at all? Who does that? Uh, I don't know. Look, the girl who was talking and she was saying to her dad, oh, my God, Becky is here. And she is like, there's like a whole bathtub full of tea. And I'm like, what the hell does that mean? And she goes, it's gossip. So, okay. So is it saying a bathtub of tea? Is that the whole saying? No, tea. It's just tea is gossip. The girl said, but you know what? You know what? I just don't get the bathtub thing. You know, How does that help me? That made it worse. You had nothing anyway, okay? <laughs> Jesus Christ, I swear to God. A tub of tea. A bunch of tea, a truck of tea, a trunk of tea. Tub is not a thing. Okay. What does anyone say in the in the, a bathtub full of Jello is a good time? Paul says, bathtub full of gin. I mean, again, I don't know. I think this is on you. Buddy, no, it's I not on me. It's on you. You're fucking. This is stupid. A bathtub full of gossip. 
what what's interesting is this has nothing to do with the game. So everyone could just vote in the room. Who makes more sense here? Me making this does. Why is why sense? does anybody have to vote? Nobody has to vote. I don't care what anybody says. I do. You're wrong. You're just wrong. You're wrong, man. You care. <laughs> you care that I'm wrong. So this, man. Hey, this is the best part of the show. Nobody gets to see us fight like this very often. <laughs> This is better than the game. <laughs> Tune in for the end. <laughs> We're like a... Five minutes before the miracle happens. Isn't that a saying? <laughs> that is a saying. See, that's a saying. You're like my guy. You're like the guy at work, Chica. He's like, bathtub full of tea. <laughs> don't, don't sink my sailboat. <laughs> I'm not saying that it's a saying that's popular. I'm it was the saying. whole. It was the whole Not chicken boodle. <laughs> the whole chicken boodle. <laughs> All right, right. See All right. now that makes sense. See, that's funny. All right. All right. Let Let's. <laughs> I I just no. I you get one more. You, okay. You were gonna do one more of these. All right. <laughs> and again, first of all, all of these examples I got off the internet. So. For, for, don't don't even don't even look at me, okay? <laughs> All right, you, you yell at the internet, <laughs> Tim. I'm over hey, here. I, I'm looking at you. At I'm staring right at you, man. Not go yell at the internet, okay? Okay. So, Peter. Yes. If you spent the afternoon draking, it means that you did what? I did a lot of this. No, um, I don't know what it is. It's the, it's this. It's this. No, it has some all right, draking. I spent the drake. I spent afternoon drake. But you said these are not in the the toilet, right? These are these are yes. higher shelf these are, than these are what the kids say. Right. So I'm not like shell it's not like shelfing. I was draking. Okay, draking. Right. right. <laughs> spent the afternoon draking. Uh I don't know. Like a up your what? I don't know. Dancing around the apartment. I don't know. Doing this. Doing a little hotline. A little yeah. hotline. Jing, jing, whatever. Okay, I have no idea. What am I doing? So if you spent the afternoon draking, it means that you cried and listened to sad music. Is that all? Oh, okay. So people do that with Drake? Yeah. It means, uh, it, it, and you and I speak, yeah. it means you murd. 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 Okay. <laughs> I listened Sorry. to some Sinead O'Connor and cried. Yeah, so that's that that is that's gonna be a thing and it's gonna be great. It's, it's gonna, gonna be great. great. God, I hope we have a younger person as a guest when we do that so they can like actually make sense of some of this shit. Cause, uh, well, here's what we're gonna do. See, wh whoever is the guest, it's gonna be both of you are going to compete in trying to get a better answer. A point will be given okay. to whoever scientifically uh, comes up with the best one. Or, it's like, know, close. that was, I love your logic. You're both wrong. But Pete, you had the best yeah. logic. Or Pete, you're stuck on the tub. Get out of the tub. Yeah. <laughs> get out of the bathtub. Exactly. Oh, shit. And you get to be the arbitrator, don't you? Who, me? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, great. I'm going to totally feed each definition game. into a computer and beep, boop, bop, beep, boop, bop, bop. It'll spit out the, you know, an, the, the most accurate. Hey, hey, get a sound effect for that and use your soundboard. You got a soundboard. You got the whole setup. I'm working on. No, you spent all this time with uh, with voice meter trying to get it so you can play sounds, and then <laughs> you never play any sounds. All right, let's get out of here, man. Okay, you ready? All right, here we go. You've just enjoyed another awesome episode of The Myth Wits. If you don't have time for videos, make sure to subscribe to our podcast via your favorite podcatcher. Do the like, follow, subscribe thing wherever it's appropriate, and make sure to share your favorite episode on social media to help spread The Myth Wits love over the entire planet. Tweet us at Myth Wits and check out MythWits.com. Myth Wits is part of the TSR Podcast Network. Check out TSRPN.com for more cool stuff. Go check it out. Look, we're trying to sell some goddamn Top Secret. Go buy a fucking copy of Top Secret, some bitch. I'm kidding, but not really. Uh, Myth Wits <laughs> is a Creative Commons product. Like and share it in all the places. Just don't edit it. Don't change it. And while it's smell of guano and sulfur, don't use it as your magical component for Fireball. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Tell your friends to tune in. 
and we'll see you all next week. Mike? Beep, boop, pop, beep, boop, boop, beep, beep.